Hey, this is Marco Benevento. And Bogey from Superhuman Happiness. Stu Bogey. And you are watching Diffuser FM on the tube. <laughs> When I uh, first heard about David Bowie passing away, I immediately got uh, Black Star and uh, dove deep into that record and realized that he was sending a message to all of us. And uh, since then, my two little girls, Ruby, who's nine, and Isla, who's six, have listened to every Bowie record on vinyl that we have at the house and there going through a big Bowie phase and I taught Ruby life on Mars on the piano and, uh, and we're keeping Bowie alive in the house in Woodstock. Yeah, when I, I, I had a similar experience when I found out about David Bowie's passing. It was morning and I was in uh, Sedona, Arizona. We had just driven out. We were in the desert. We found out and we put Black Star on, listened to the whole thing, driving through the desert. Just oh, meditated nice. on that. <laughs> yeah. They said it felt so real. Yeah. Uh, Hunky Dory was definitely a, one of my personal favorite Bowie records, and uh, we had the chance to cover the whole record with Superhuman Happiness and at the Knitting Factory in Brooklyn. And, uh, yeah, Rick Wakeman is playing keys. But, uh, yeah, that's such a great record. We're playing a bunch of Bowie tunes tonight, and uh, we're doing stuff, a lot of stuff from Hunky Dory. And then we sort of expanded over to Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane and uh, um, Young Americans. And, uh, and we're going to sort of sprinkle in some of my own tunes in there because we just put out a record called The Story of Fred Short on April 1st. And um, well, we're going to be doing some slight interpretating on this stuff, some sax solos and some piano solos and... Uh, various little sections where we can explore a little bit, um, you know, but for the most part, we're sort of playing the tunes down and um, just going to have our own slight slight take on it, I guess. Uh, yeah, I feel like with the story of Fred Short, what we did differently compared to our, our previous record, Swift, basically I spent we spent more time with it. Swift, we recorded in three days. And with the story of Fred Short, I wanted to spend some more time with it than three days. And um, I had my friend Kenny Siegel, who has a studio in... Um, Catskill called Old Soul. He came over and and was sort of my vocal coach and like really, you know, we would spend like two or three hours on one song really getting the vocals right. Oh, that's the way to do it. You know, and uh, I didn't know Kenny worked on that. Yeah, movie. Kenny came over oh, and, and yeah, he he sort of he was like my training wheels like to yeah. make my own first record in my place. Yeah. Oh man. Well, it's, yeah. It's, it's another level for you. It's, it's another level. Work. It's just I don't know. With Swift, it was my first time singing on a record. This, this is my second time, so I was sort of over the over the hump, the beginner's hump. I mean, I'm still a beginner, but I'm not like as scared as I, anymore about singing, and um, so I was. I'm not as self conscious about it, and um, yeah, I just wanted to make it, and I also wanted to make it less wet, meaning less reverby, and uh, have this record sort of be a dry uh, record, which is sort of. Every, you can hear sort of every instrument and, uh, you know, almost more minimalistic. There wasn't one specific record that made me think doing a conceptual record would be a good idea or a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, those artists and albums you just mentioned definitely came up and I would sort of check them out, like, you know, Rush 2112 or Ziggy Stardust. And I thought, you know, a lot of bands sort of or like, you know, The Who with Tommy and um, Fish with like Game Hinge and all that stuff. Like, I, I feel like it's just an added element to your story as a band. It's not something that, you know, defines you completely as a band, but it gets listeners sort of checking out, like, what the heck is he talking about? Who's Fred Short? I don't even, like the confusion almost draws people in, mm. in this odd way. Like, what sort of character, what are you doing? And I've gotten a great response for the record, and this is our sixth record, and it's funny how just sort of getting super creative and making up a story about some guy, you know, that, that my, this is the street that I live on. Um, you know, it was, it definitely lured people into like wanting to know what was on this record. And um, I spent some time sort of searching online to try to get my story together and reading about Ziggy Stardust and, you know, 2112 online and just 
trying to figure out how my story is going to fit into, I don't know, everything that's out there. And but anyway, yeah, it was it was fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Businesses get bloated, and then they, you know, they fall apart into smaller specific ones. The music industry, there'll be a giant boom, and everybody will listen to be one thing, and then everybody's listening to different things. I think that that's a cycle that goes through, and I think that it happens simultaneously in different ways. Um, I think ideas float through the world that way. You know, right now you're going to hear like those rolled hi-hats of like the trap hip hop. You're going to hear those in all kinds of music. And so that idea is going to become kind of dominant. And then eventually it's going to break up. People are going to stop and it's going to go back to, okay, this one person's going to go back to the 60s for the references of percussion. Another person's going to go to Morocco. You know what I mean? So, so things will, they mass and then they break up. They mass and they break up in like a sort of, zeitgeist breathing <laughs> sort of way you know what i mean throughout society and arts and i imagine festivals are the same i think the festivals that are going to survive are the ones that have grassroots that are based on yeah people and love and watching marco roll in it's it's hugs and he knows everybody and you know this is like your hometown if this was a town this is a mountain right i know the difference but it, it's yeah, like yeah. it's like your home mountain you know it, it's yeah, like we're walking true. it's like you're uh, yogi bear and this is yellowstone park or something <laughs> J yellowstone did i say yellowstone yellowstone, <laughs> yellowstone park <laughs> i just think it's it's funny how seeing a band like an analog band playing their in actual instruments is like kind of becoming this like novelty thing yes you true. know where they're like, well, look, they like, are they all play? Like, wow, they're really talented. You know, like, I haven't seen that in a while because there's a lot of like people dancing to this DJ. And, and again, that's music and art and, and I do like it. Um, but it's, it's funny how the, the bands are not bands. They're like either like one dude or two dudes with a laptop and some instruments. Yeah. And to see a full band actually play with all their imperfections and all their weird sounds that they have on stage is is become uh, almost like a dinosaur act you know yeah. where you are just like whoa oh wow those, those guys are yeah. actually playing instruments that's that's cool that's like old school but like that's how it's always been and oh, until over the last 10 years there's just been a surge of electronic bands that show up with minimal gear and and you know pump their mixes and take and yeah. take track out tracks out and it's hard no, to compete with a machine. I think that there's a deficiency of live dance music for two main reasons. One, and this may be the only reason you need, is economics. Yeah, I was just going to say. You know, yeah, throwing six people into a van and driving yeah. to the gig yeah. costs a lot of money. I mean, six people. And if we're yeah. talking about like a Cool in the Gang or like right. the Commodores or a band right. that really would throw parties yeah. or like Fela, Cootie's right. band. Right. More, you're you're way talking about more than six. a couple <laughs> dozen people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, with the handlers and everything, and the money doesn't get better. You know, if you're a, a you know, if you're a big DJ, you, the, the same check is same for the giant change. band. <laughs> right. So it's like they could be, you know, making like a super popular giant band could be making a, a middle class living, and you know, and a DJ is just paid out the frame. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's and true. I, I think that I think it's economics. Yeah. The other side is I think that people don't necessarily. We're not. M musicians aren't trained to play with dancers the way they should be. If we were in other continents, Africa, Asia, you know, with the Javanese, Gamelan, those things, it, dance and music are paired. Right. It's like you play, people move, and the, the hmm. association between the two, right. it's almost... It's almost singular, right. the way they, they merge together. Instead of a disconnect between the performer and, and the sit-down audience or right. the, the observing sort of audience right. that's so, you know, checking them out. Yeah. So I'm, I'm playing, and I'm trying to feed your body. I'm trying right. to get you open, and we're having a, a spiritual experience together. And I think that that's something that's difficult to develop. It's costly because of the economics it's we talked about. And, and the first time you do that with a band, it doesn't sound like that. It takes <laughs> practice and time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, any. Yeah, so it's easily you could easily be discouraged, much like any young kid would be discouraged when they first learn how to play guitar or piano. But it just takes, or whatever instrument, <laughs> it just takes time to to realize that it can be effortless and it can be a very deep connection to the audience and it can be a very physical, fun experience where you dance and you forget about everything that went wrong yeah. throughout the day or whatever. Yeah. But anyway, we're rambling. Next question. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.